the Restrict Act here in the United States, a wild update to an older story, a Wi-Fi protocol flaws, and so much more. Welcome to Surveillance Report 128, where we're dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news from the past week. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from TechLore. This week, our promo segment, as always, we are sponsor free thanks to you guys. So if you want to keep us that way, be sure to head over to Patreon, where for $5 a month, you can ask one of our Q&A questions, or for $10 a month, you can get an ad free segment that has more of our rants and does not have this promo spot. If you don't care about any of that, but you want to support us in a recurring way, we have LibrePay. And finally, of course, if you don't care about any of that and you just want to protect your privacy but still keep us going, we have Monero. We see all those contributions. We don't know anything about you, but they are very much appreciated. So no matter which route you take to uh, keep us going, we appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for the help. All right, we're jumping right in this week, and we're going to start off with one that you guys might have heard about. It's starting to pick up a little steam here in the U.S., and it is called the Restrict Act, which I had the pleasure of reading all 55 pages this week. It's so... So fun. I'm going to go ahead and quote this article that I think came from Vice here. It says, The Restrict Act, a proposed piece of legislation which, pro which provides one way the government might ban TikTok, contains, quote, insanely broad language and could lead to other apps or communication services with connections to foreign countries being banned in the U.S., multiple digital rights experts told Motherboard. The bill could have implications not just for social networks, but potentially security tools such as VPNs that consumers use to encrypt and route their traffic. Although the intention of the bill is to target apps or services that pose a threat to national security, these critics worry it may have much wider implications for the First Amendment. Under the Restrict Act, the Department of Commerce would identify information and communication technology products that foreign adversary that a foreign adversary has any interest in or poses an unacceptable risk to national security, the announcement reads. The bill only applies to technology linked to a foreign adversary. Those countries include China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and Venezuela. The bill's language includes vague, term vague terms such as desktop applications, mobile applications, gaming applications, payment applications, and web-based applications. It also targets uh, applicable software that has more than 1 million users in the U.S. So one privacy advocate from Access Now said that as written, the broad language in the Restrict Act could criminalize the use of a VPN, significantly impacting access to security tools and other applications that vulnerable people rely on for privacy and security. Rachel Cohen, who is the communications director for Senator Warren, who's the person who uh, uh, sponsored this bill or like introduced it, responded by telling Motherboard in an email, this legislation is aimed squarely at companies like Kaspersky, Huawei, and TikTok that create systemic risks to the United States national security, not at individual users. She added the threshold for criminal penalty in this bill is incredibly high, too high to ever be concerned with the actions of an individual user of TikTok or a VPN. Two other privacy advocates pointed to another potential solution, the U.S. passing a more fundamental privacy law. They said if Congress is serious about addressing risks to American privacies, it could accomplish far more by focusing its efforts on passing comprehensive privacy legislation like the American Data and Protection Act. I hate to downplay this because let me be upfront. This is alarming. Um, this is very broad. This is dangerously broad. And it's also horribly misguided for obvious reasons, I, I think, to our target audience, being that it targets foreign countries when, as we've said time and time again, all these American countries are doing the exact same thing. And like, no joke, this act, there's literally, I forget exactly where it is, but there's literally a section that basically says like, you can't target American companies. Like if TikTok hypothetically sold to an American company tomorrow, they would no longer be uh, subject <laughs> to this act. I'm not even kidding. That's exactly what it says. It's ridiculous. I think saying that it could criminalize use of a VPN is a little bit of a stretch. Um, the act does say that you cannot knowingly conspire to circumvent the act, which is kind of obvious. All laws say that. And it also does say that you can't use um, tools that are designed to circumvent it. VPNs were not designed to circumvent the Resist Act. Like, can they be used for that? Yes. Could you, in theory, be tried under that first part I mentioned where you conspired to circumvent the act by using a VPN? Sure. Are they going to ban Proton VPN or Molvad or iVPN? I think that would be a real stretch because they would have to prove that that app exists for the sole purpose and intention of getting around the Restrict Act. And we all know there's so many other uses for a VPN. I don't think that they're going to criminalize VPNs or Tor. Uh, I don't think that individuals are really going to get a million dollar fine and 20 years in prison, which is the maximum that this bill allows for. I think that's more designed for companies like uh, Cohen said. That said, obviously we're not fans. We think this is, like I said, this is um, completely misguided. It only focuses on foreign companies. Oh yeah, that that too. Services like Proton and Mulvad and IVPN are not based in foreign adversary companies, so they can't be banned anyways. The worst you could do is get in trouble for using them to evade the ban. I think this bill is actually a very embarrassing 
bill for the U.S. to even propose. I think that all it does is admit defeat that TikTok won. TikTok has beat all these other social media platforms. It has achieved what it's wanted to achieve. And the U.S. now is like, we have no way of responding to this. Our only option is to try to, to ban it because of this weird, like, it's ridiculous. So, like, in a way, if this is like a whole, you know, arms race between the U.S. and China, I would say China won. Um, and yeah, because we are now responding. You know what? If China did this, what if China, you know, proposed this restrict act? So that they could give themselves, they already have this, but like, let's say they could give themselves power to ban just only adversary <laughs> issues within the country. People would be like, wow, that's the most China thing I've ever heard. But we're trying to do that here in the US. It's it's so dystopian and ridiculous. And I love how it's not even all foreign made things. It's just adversary countries, only our enemies. And it's like, and what I don't like about it is that you said that, you know, you, you referenced the spokesperson for um uh, Senator Rachel War Cohen. Warner. Yes, Rachel yeah. Cohen. Um and that that's the communications director for Senator War Warner and it's like yeah, we're not trying to target individual users. But that's right now. Obviously their goal isn't to target VPN users. It's not the purpose of this bill, but who's to say in 20 years if this does pass, this wouldn't be like the starting points of us trying to target those individuals as well. And so that's also what I don't like. I like to always think, well, in four years, when we have a different, um, we have a different president, when the Congress starts shifting around, what are the laws that will be passed then? And do we want this stuff around for when that happens? Um, and I, I don't. So I think that this is just, I think it's laughably hilarious in like the, a very sad way, not a not a, I think this is funny thing. I think this is just embarrassing. All right, well now we're gonna go and move into the data breaches. First data breach, income details included in a massive data breach affecting millions of Dutch residents. So this was reported in the Netherlands this week and it also includes at least some sensitive financial information. The leak includes the income data of people who are still accruing a pension with the PME Pension Fund, in addition to their names, genders, ages, and phone numbers. The data of roughly 2 million residents of the Netherlands may have been stolen in a cybercrime when outside parties reportedly used a security hole and managed to gain access to companies using software from Nebu. The company has not commented on the data breach and neither has its publicly traded Canadian parent, NCAL Systems. One lawsuit has already been filed in the matter and I wouldn't be surprised if we get updates to this story lack of a statement is going to be a theme this week because our next uh, data breach comes from Brightline. So the headline says children's data feared stolen in Fortra ransomware attack. And Fortra is the whole go anywhere thing. So we're still seeing that. Here we are, what, two months later. Brightline is a virtual coaching and therapy for children company. They I are like part of Blue going. Shield of California. <laughs> oh, you're really going to love this. Uh, they're part of Blue Shield, Blue Shield of California, and they recently filed a data breach disclosure with the Attorney General in Maine on March 27th, stating that attackers accessed and possibly stole the data of more than 63,000 patients, including names, addresses, dates of birth, genders, Blue Shield subscriber ID numbers, phone numbers, email addresses, plan names, and plan group numbers. However, Brightline has otherwise said Nothing. No public statements, no social media or website posts. And when TechCrunch reached out to them for comment, they were declined to answer questions. Next data breach. <laughs> Latitude financial data breach now impacts 14 million customers. So this is an update to a story from last week, so make sure you're always staying subscribed. But the Australian loan giant Latitude Financial Services is warning customers that its data breach is now much more significant than it initially stated. Uh, it's always the pattern. And it's taking the number of affected individuals from 328,000 to 14 million. So they really, they really understated they that. They really lowballed sure. that one. <laughs> yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah it's, it's, we'll give them the lowest bit of the range. So the stolen data, again, is mostly driver's licenses from Australia and New Zealand, 40% of which were provided to them in the, in the last 10 years. 94% came from before 2013, dating all the way back to 2005. Also includes customer full names, addresses, telephone numbers, and date of births. 53,000 passport numbers also were stolen. And in the past, listeners have written in to inform us that you can freeze your credit in Australia for 21 days for free. Only 21 days? Um, you have three agencies, Equifax. Apparently Equifax is just a worldwide behemoth. Um, and Experian, and then I Ilian. Companies, we're gonna start off with our good old friends Clearview. We haven't heard from them in quite a while. 
Um, there's really nothing explosive here. It's just kind of an update. It says Clearview AI used nearly 1 million times by US police. And this comes from the BBC. Quoting the article, facial recognition firm Clearview has run nearly a million searches for US police, its founder has told the BBC. CEO Han Ton Tat also revealed Clearview now has 30 billion images scraped from platforms such as Facebook, taken without users' permissions, and also without Facebook's permission because Facebook told them to stop doing that. The company has been repeatedly fined millions of dollars in Europe and Australia for breaches of privacy. Critics argue that the police's use of Clearview puts everyone into a perpetual police lineup. The figure of a million searches comes from Clearview and has not been confirmed by police. The company is banned from selling its services to most U.S. companies after the ACLU took Clearview AI to court in Illinois for breaking privacy laws, but there is an exception for police, and Mr. Tontat says that his software is used by hundreds of police forces across the U.S. There are a handful of documented cases of mistaken identity using facial recognition by the police. However, the lack of data and transparency around police use means the figure is likely far higher. Mr. Tontat says the... <laughs> I love this part. Mr. Tontat says he is not aware of any cases of mistaken identity using Clearview. He accepts police have made wrongful arrests using facial recognition technology, but attributes those to poor policing. Clearview often points to research that shows it has a near 100% accuracy rate, but these figures are often based on mugshots. In reality, the accuracy of Clearview depends on the quality of the image that is fed into it. This last bit was in response to somebody else, uh, a lawyer who was commenting on Clearview. Uh, Mr. Tontat told the BBC that he does not want to testify in court to its accuracy. So... You can tell he's near 100% accuracy. Don't make me say that on the stand. All right, next story is from our next favorite company, Meta, aka Facebook, who wants EU users to apply for permission to opt out of data collection. Meta announced that starting next Wednesday, some Facebook and Instagram users in the EU will, for the first time, be able to opt out of sharing first-party data used to serve highly personalized ads. The move marks a big change from Meta's current business model, where every video and piece of content clicked on its platform provides a data point for its online advertisers. People, quote, familiar with the matter, told the journal that Facebook and Instagram users will soon be able to access a form that can be, can be submitted to Meta to object to sweeping data collection. If those requests are approved, those users will only allow Meta to target ads based on broader categories of data collection, like age range or general location. You know, just general location, no big deal. Um, this is different from efforts by other major tech companies like Apple and Google, which prompt users to opt in or out of highly personalized ads with the click of a button. In Apple's case, assuming they're doing it. Instead, Meta will review objection forms to evaluate reasons provided by individual users to end such data collection before it will approve any opt-outs. It's unclear what cause Meta may have to deny requests. God, I, I hate this company so much. Um, a Meta spokesperson told Ars, uh, Ars Technica that Meta is not sharing the objection form publicly at this time, but that it will be available to EU users in its help center starting on April 5th. That's the deadline Meta was given to comply with the Irish regulator's ruling that it was illegal in the EU for Meta to force Facebook and Instagram users to give consent to data collection when they sign contracts to use the platform. Meta still plans to appeal those rulings, by the way, um, believing that its prior contracts legal basis complies with the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, and in the meantime, though, the company must change its legal basis for data collection. Meta announced in a blog post today that it will now argue that it does not need to directly obtain user consent because it has a, quote, legitimate interest to collect data to operate its social platforms. God, I hate this company. Like, every time... I think that like there is like anything substantially okay about Meta or Facebook, they somehow just dip lower and lower. It's just such an evil company to the core. I hate Facebook. I hate talking about Facebook. Evil company, evil people, evil CEO. Okay, with that, we'll move into research. Uh, we're gonna start off with an interesting one that says Wi-Fi protocol flaw allows attackers to hijack network traffic. I don't think this is quite as worrisome as it sounds. We'll talk about that. Quoting the article, cybersecurity researchers have discovered a fundamental security flaw in the design of the IEEE 802.11 Wi-Fi protocol standard, allowing attackers to trick access points into leaking network frames in plain text form, which is bad. Wi-Fi frames are data containers consisting of a header, data payload, and trailer, which include information such as the source and destination MAC address, control and management data. The researchers found, uh, and for the record, the article fully explains all this stuff in much better detail. We're just condensing here as always. Uh, the researchers found that the queued and buffered frames are not adequately protected from adversaries who can manipulate data transmission, client spoofing, frame redirection, and capturing. Unquote. So this affects Linux, FreeBSD, iOS, and Android. And if I understood the article correctly, basically when a device is offline, uh, and I'm assuming this probably only happens for like a minute, 
Uh, but when the device is offline, the router can store traffic that is meant for the device until it comes back online. Therefore, an attacker can spoof a device and trick the router into sending the traffic there instead. And because the route, the traffic is unencrypted between you and the router, it, you know, it just works. Uh, they're, they're able to see everything. Cisco was the first vendor to acknowledge this vulnerability and say, hey, you're right, this is a thing. And uh, it's unclear if they're going to try to fix it or not, but they did say that there are some things you can do. Uh, for example, a lot of their devices come with policy enforcement mechanisms, and they also recommended making sure that all your traffic is using TLS security. You could also just make sure you're using HTTPS, which most websites uh, support nowadays and apps and things like that. So that's definitely a good defense. VPNs, Tor, those are also good defenses because they encrypt everything between your device and the destination. So, yeah. Microsoft has pushed an OOB update security patch for Windows snipping tool flaw. So we covered this. Again, you gotta stay subscribed to the surveillance report because then you get all the updates and you get the solutions um, to the, th the issues we cover. Um, but there was an issue with Windows snipping tool that I believe, was it that the one that it allows you? Oh yeah, this is an Acropolis story. So it allowed you to pretty much uncrop images after you send them to people. Um, Microsoft has pushed an update to Windows 10 and 11, um, which fixes this issue. One extra note here, Microsoft classified this vulnerability as low because they argue it requires uncommon user interaction and several factors outside the attacker's control, such as taking a screenshot, saving it to a file, modifying it, then saving it to the same location which sounds like a pretty understandable attack vector and use case, so. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll move into politics. Uh, we do have quite a bit of stories here. We'll start off with the Biden executive order that bans federal agencies from using commercial spyware. So unfortunately, this article is pretty light on details. I wish they would have expanded a little more, but here's what we know. Quote, the Biden administration on Monday announced a new executive order that would broadly ban U.S. federal agencies from using commercially developed spyware that poses threats to human rights and national security. The move comes as officials confirm that dozens of U.S. government personnel had their phones targeted, unquote. Honestly, that was really the only useful paragraph in this article. The rest of it was just kind of talking about spyware in general and some of the different vendors like NSO Group. There was a part at the end that I thought was pretty interesting where they noted that executive orders can be rescinded at any time, including future administrations. So uh, this isn't really like a, a law or anything like that. Biden can roll it back anytime he wants. Whoever takes over after Biden can roll it back anytime they want. So yeah, it's not really a meaningful protection, but it's an interesting development. Lawmakers have called on USPS, which is the United States Postal Service, to combat the surge in change of address fraud. This is also an update to an old story where we pretty much what happens is people fill out this change of address form and forward other people's email, mail, not email, <laughs> forward other people's mail to themselves. And this requires no identification and anyone can do it. A group of bipartisan lawmakers has called on the U.S. Postal Service to strengthen its internal processes to reduce a change of address fraud, which each year allows fraudsters to redirect thousands of people's mail, including bills, checks, or bank statements. House lawmakers are pushing USPS to allow anyone the ability to freeze an address change, just as someone would freeze their credit report to prevent fraud. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. I like that. The letter comes soon after TechCrunch reported the case of a former Microsoft executive whose mail was rerouted by criminals who filed an address change on the former executive's behalf. That's the story we covered here in Surveillance Report several weeks ago. Um, the former executive caught the bogus address change quickly, but thousands of other victims each year aren't so lucky. It's worth noting that this is somewhat of a common thing that's rising each year. The post office's watchdog reported that more than 23,000 cases in 2021 where someone had fraudulently filed a change of address request with the USPS. So that's a lot of, you know, 23,000 people affected by this. And these are probably, I assume, um, higher target individuals is what I had to guess, but um, we don't know that. Um, and a spokesperson for the USPS Inspector General told TechCrunch at the time that USPS is supposed to check a person's government ID, like a passport or driver's license when filing a paper change of address form. Um, but also you can do it online with none of that information. And TechCrunch found that USPS relies almost entirely on trusting the person signing the paper form, often without any verification checks at all. And again, you can do it online with none of that information. So The next story is infuriating. The DEA bought customer data from rogue employees instead of getting a warrant. Uh, for years, the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Agency, secretly paid workers inside U.S. agencies and companies for access to user data rather than going to a court to obtain ser a search warrant for such data. That included paying sources inside the parcel industry to open and reroute packages, airline industry sources who provided flight itineraries, dates of birth, and seat numbers, and workers at private bus companies who provided daily lists of passengers who brought bought tickets in cash. 
Now a pair of bipartisan lawmakers are pushing the Department of Justice to tighten policies around confidential human sources that would ban the practice entirely across the DOJ, including the DEA and FBI. After the revelation of the DEA paying for information came to light in 2014 and 2016 reports from watchdog bodies, the DEA said in its own letter to the senators that the agency had updated its policy to ban payments of employees of other agencies or quasi-government agencies. But recently, Senator Ron Wyden's office was told that the DEA's policy still allows agents to pay employees inside private companies for access to data. Over the past several years, law enforcement agencies like the DEA, CPB, which I think is Customs and Border Patrol, and the FBI, as well as sections of the military, have been buying data from data brokers. This has included smartphone location data collected by ordinary apps. Critics argue that such data should ordinarily require a warrant to obtain after a Supreme Court ruling in 2018, which related to cell site location data. The agencies instead simply buy access from the data, buy access to the data from private companies. So um, the next story, which ties into this, is the NYPD, the New York Police Department, is refusing to comply with New York City's new surveillance tech laws. So the POST Act, which is the Public Oversight of Surveillance Technology, was signed into law in 2020 and required the NYPD to disclose information about its current and future surveillance technologies and how it wants to use them. Personal note, seems pretty fair. Next, the impact and use policies, the IUPs, were supposed to describe the capabilities of surveillance technology and include any rules, processes, and guidelines that regulate access to or use of the technology and any prohibitions or restrictions on its use and any potential disparate impacts, according to the report. But the OIG, NYPD, said that the 36 IUPs NYPD published after the acts was signed were general and not detailed, leaving them unable to conduct an audit and assess whether NYPD's use of surveillance devices complies with its IUPs and reported any suspected violations. The report also detailed what recommendations from the OIG that the NYPD implemented regarding the POST Act and other policing issues. They sent 15 recommendations to NYPD for POST Act related items and NYPD rejected 14 of them. The only recommendation NYPD is considering is whether police should release a press release when it makes a new IUP for a new technology, which is available for public comment under the law. Among the recommendations the OIG NYPD says the NYPD rejected were reports on the potential disparate impacts on protected groups of the use and deployment of surveillance technology, disclosing what external agencies the NYPD shared data with, and two relating to how it used and audited its facial recognition technology. This next one comes from Texas. Uh, well, this actually comes from... Not that these are mutually exclusive. This comes from Reddit. So there's not a lot in here. Uh, the headline says Texas Senator and Representative Representative introduce age verification legislation requiring government ID for adult sites. So unfortunately, this is a trend that we are seeing a lot of states uh, at very least push for this, I think. But either way, we're seeing a lot of states push for it. I know at least one has passed it. I want to say two, but I could be wrong about that. Um so these are Texas Senators Brian Hughes and Terry Leo Wilson, who have announced SB 2164 and HB 3585, respectively, that seek to force any online provider that publishes adult content to enforce age verification systems. That's kind of all we know unless we read the bills ourselves, which unfortunately I have not had time to do. I was busy reading the Restrict Act. Next up, Iowa becomes the sixth state with its own data privacy law. So Iowa has joined California, Virginia, Utah, Connecticut, and Colorado as the only states in the U.S. with a comprehensive data privacy law on the books. Iowa's bill passed unanimously in the state's House and Senate earlier this month, and it's set to take effect on January 1st, 2025, so long ways away. Um, while the Iowa privacy law is similar to the five others, it bears the most similarity to Utah's law, the Utah Consumer Privacy Act, as it also defines personal data. It also lays out consumer data privacy rights, which include the right to confirm whether a controller is processing data and to access that data, the right to delete data provided by the consumer, the right to data portability, the right to opt out of data sales, and the right to non-retaliation for exercising consumer rights. Iowa's framework differs, however, from a few others since it requires covered entities to provide a clear notice of data usage and opt-out option for sensitive data, which it defines as racial or ethnic origin, religious beliefs, mental or physical diagnosis, sexual orientation, citizenship, or immigration status. Colorado, Connecticut, and Virginia have opt-in requirements, and Iowa's law does not contain a private right of action, which means plaintiffs in Iowa would not be able to bring cases against entities for non-compliance. Instead, compliance with the law will be enforced exclusively by the Iowa Attorney General, who must provide entities 90 days to correct compliance issues. I think this is a step in the right direction, which is kind of how I feel about 
a lot of these um, requirements and laws. I think it's better than not having anything, but it'd be cool to see a little, something a little bit more rigorous here that gives consumers even more um, rights and power over their data. And our last political story is a good good news. It comes from the EFF, and it says, after students challenge proctoring software, French court slaps test we app with a suspension. So the title pretty much says it all. Um, the article goes on to talk about the rise of proctoring software and the privacy issues that come with it. We've talked about this on past episodes as well. I mainly wanted to share this as motivation for listeners. You know, sometimes the privacy fight seems overwhelming or hopeless, but stories like this prove that we can make progress. It is possible. Um, you just got to be persistent and tenacious. And now FOSS, free and open source news. We only have one story this week. And frankly, you know, we're... We're kind of done with Canonical, but it's still the news. Um, So Ubuntu Cinnamon Remix becomes an official Ubuntu flavor. So this was created and maintained by members of the Linux community, but now Ubuntu Cinnamon Remix is is an official Ubuntu derivative that features the modern Cinnamon desktop environment developed by the Linux Mint team. Um, I'm surprised to hear this given how Ubuntu is trying to do their own thing in every regard, but now they're wanting to combine the Cinnamon desktop environment. This is interesting. Um, the Remix maintainers have applied for official Ubuntu flavor status several times in the past, but only now Canonical has decided to welcome it into its family of official Ubuntu flavors, starting with the upcoming release of Lunar Lobster 23.04, due on April 20th, 2023. Unity was also approved in September and will be available as well on April 20th. So those are two new options that are going to be available in the coming weeks. All right. With that, we'll move into Misfits. It was kind of a short week. Uh, we got a couple of good stories here. Our first one says Emotet malware distributed as fake W9 tax forms for the I- from the IRS. So we're again, we're sharing this one just to keep you guys on your toes. Make sure you're careful about this. Uh, once Emotet is installed, the malware will steal victims' emails to use in future reply chain attacks, uh, send further spam emails, and ultimately install other mal- malware that provides initial access to other threat actors such as ransomware gangs. They use a variety of file types to hide the malicious behavior. So things like .docs, uh, .zip, stuff like that. The official W9 form is a PDF. And for the record, PDFs can also hide malware. So that's not necessarily saying if you're a contractor who gets a PDF, you're not necessarily in the clear. But you know, if you're not a contractor and it's a zip file or anything like that, huge red flag. So... um. Yeah, just be aware of that kind of stuff. Uh, Maybe open things at a virtual machine just to be safe. We saw that last week with Linus Tech Tips and all that. So yeah, just be on your toes. It's it's that time of year where the scams are rampant. And this next one is a very long update. So make sure to stay subscribed for years to surveillance report because this was a long one. So to give you a primer, back in 2021, um, news broke of a cyber attack in Florida where a water treatment plant supposedly was hacked and they released toxic stuff into the water and it was a whole ordeal, right? Turns out this was actually caused by an employee error. And the article headline actually kind of downplays what happened here. According to one official who was with the city at the time, the incident was actually not a hack at all. But it was actually a case of an employee who mistakenly clicked the wrong buttons before alerting his superiors to his error. So they did report it. The employee screwed up. They reported it. But the former city manager described it as a non-event that was resolved in two minutes but said that law enforcement and the media seized on the idea of a cyber attack and just ran with it. The attention resulted in a four-month FBI investigation, which they said reached the same conclusion that employee error was to blame. Weird story. I did not expect to get an update to that story years later. Okay, and our last story says German police raid DDoS-friendly host fly hosting. Uh, So this is another one of those stories that I wanted to share because there is a moral here. Quoting the article, Fly Hosting first advertised on cybercrime forums in November 2022, saying it was a Germany-based hosting firm that was open for business to anyone looking for reliable places to host malware, botnet controllers, or DDoS for higher infrastructure, unquote. For anyone who thinks that a company is going to tell law enforcement to screw off, you might be right. They might do it. For now. And then eventually, this happens, where the police come knocking on their door and shut them down. Maybe you're not a criminal. Maybe you're just really that hardcore libertarian and you want a service that is totally going to disrespect laws, but that service will also inevitably attract criminals, inevitably attract law enforcement attention, and they will get shut down. And now your data will be caught up as part of the investigation, even if only temporarily. That'll be part of the evidence that they have to sift through and look at. Stop expecting companies to do illegal things to protect you or else expect for things like this to happen. Those are your two options. 
or self-host. I guess those are your three options. So that's all I got. All right, and now the Q&A. And so Nate and I were talking for the last couple of weeks about what we're going to do as we get more and more questions. And so our current solution is we are going to answer about two to three questions. We'll kind of just pick and choose a, a small selection of questions for the official surveillance report. So in this case, we're going to answer Richard and Anon Patron's question. However, there are two more questions here from Edhead and just Patreon. That's their username there, just Patreon. Very creative username. Um, however, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be releasing those latter two questions as just quick shorts throughout the week. It's a way for us to upload a little bit more, be a little bit more engaged with our audience here. And it also won't take up as much time because we've been editing these and we realize that for some reports, almost half of the report is just the Q&A section. So we're going to try to keep it a little bit shorter. And that also forces us to have to answer your questions within a one minute period. Um, so it's just a way to for us to still answer all of your questions, not take up too much of too much of our time, but we still get to pick some questions that we think would be really good to answer in the long form factor as well. So um, feel free to leave any feedback on that idea. We're going to try it out this week so you all can see what that looks like, and then we will make modifications from there. But we're going to be answering Edhead and Patreon's questions um, later this week as shorts, and we're going to answer Richard and Anon patrons right now. All right, so the first question from Richard, why would privacy.com and Apple Pay protect your privacy? Apple knows who you are and what you are doing. Thanks. So this is in reference to myself talking about how I've been able to join the beta. It's a public, I, I didn't get special treatment here, but there was a public beta that um, privacy.com, which is an aliasing service, so you can generate um, on-demand cards that you can use really anywhere. Um, but it was mostly used online because there are card numbers that you input into like online forms. So you can actually use privacy.com cards when you're going to businesses in person. You're asking, since Apple knows who you are and what you're doing, why does this matter? Um, so just to start this off, I always avoid the Nirvana fallacy, which is pretty much the idea that there has to, since if there's a better solution out there or a more perfect solution, therefore we shouldn't do anything. Um, and just because, let, first off, Apple actually knows very little about Apple Pay payments. Um, you can actually look into this. You can see how the technology works. It's something that's pretty easily verifiable. Apple knows very limited information on every transaction. Apple doesn't want to have that information. But if you distrust Apple, if you're going to start throwing claims that aren't really based on any evidence about how it's proprietary and everything, sure, we'll just go along with that and act like that is what's happening here. Um, even if Apple knows who you are, what you're doing, and all of that, there's still a third party versus first party issue here. And this is what people don't understand about aliasing. People, because also privacy.com knows exactly who you are. It's a KYC platform. So why don't we extend this argument to, well, privacy.com knows who you are, so what's the point? The point is you're not having to share your credit card number, your single credit card number for your actual credit card with dozens of companies every day. In the event where one gets breached, now your credit card that you use for everything is exposed to the public. When you're using alias information, you're transferring trust to one individual to now be able to not have to trust hundreds of individuals. This still applies here even if Apple knows exactly who you are and what you're doing. Now it's just two people know what you're doing instead of, again, hundreds right? We don't want, you, you know, in a typical shopping trip, let's say you go to Target, let's say you go to a convenience store, let's say you get gas for your car, let's say you go and pick up some clothes for your kids. Why would you want four parties to know your card number, your name, and everything else about your financial purchases there, instead of just being able to restrict that to just privacy.com and Apple consistently over a course of a long period of time? And by the way, certain threat models that might not fit, maybe certain threat models, you don't actually want those central parties to have everything in one place. But for myself and for a lot of people, it's a worthy trade-off to be able to keep things first party. It's not even a concern, it's just more of a point to make, which is Apple Pay actually already protects your card numbers. So I would actually argue what the effectiveness is of using a privacy.com card inside of Apple Pay from a privacy perspective, because Apple already sends kind of like pseudo card information um, to merchants that you use Apple Pay with. So you don't even really have to worry much about privacy from third parties if you're using Apple Pay. It's already an improvement than using your actual card. Um, but the reason why I would still personally like to use privacy.com cards is A, in the event that Apple is collecting some kind of data, at least it's not tied to my actual card number. And B, I always like to assume there is some incorrect technology, um, maybe Apple is over-promising what they're doing, maybe there's some bug that actually allows places like Target to find out your actual credit card number. It's always good to assume that, you know, you don't want to over-rely on technology. And so I always like to layer up when I can. And so using something like a privacy.com card inside of Apple Pay is just one extra layer of protection in the event that Apple Pay isn't actually doing what it's promising to do. 
Um, hopefully that answers your question. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna really send this home. Richard, your question comes from a place of Apple knows who you are and what you're doing, and there's this, there's this attitude of then why does it matter? It still matters. You're never gonna have perfect privacy. So I'd personally get that out of your head uh, because you're never gonna have perfect, there's always gonna be one more person who knows who you are and what you're doing. Um, to the extent of which is debatable and that's gonna be different for each person, but just because there's always someone else who knows, limiting the number of people who know is still a goal and it's still an improvement. We can't be like, oh, well, because then it's an endless game rather than actually like a realistic privacy journey. That's what I'll leave that with. Uh, I was gonna say, I guess I'll go ahead and take the next question from a non-patron, which says cybersecurity is all well and good, Trader, just yeah yeah that's all well and good no i'm kidding uh but what are some tips and things you guys do for physical and home security assuming a normal threat model quote unquote normal because obviously everybody's a little different in a relatively low crime area do you feel security cameras are worth the privacy impact um i'm glad you brought this up because i actually do feel like physical security is very much glossed over and it's something that i have not spent as much time studying as i would like to but i have put a little bit of work into it um I will try to remember to throw it in the show notes, but I've actually pulled up here about a year ago. I wrote a blog post about uh, physical home security. Like one of the things I do is I I replace the uh, the screws in my door anywhere I move. And I definitely ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And uh, because the actual screws, I think I've mentioned that. I feel like I mentioned this before. The actual screws in your door are half inch screws. And my gauge here is one inch. So the only thing Keeping somebody from kicking out your door is a nail half the size of this thing. And I don't know, that that doesn't make me feel good, to be totally honest. Anyways, like regarding cameras specifically, it, security cameras are for capturing evidence. Uh, they're not going to stop uh, a crime in progress. Um, I want to say, didn't somebody write us and tell us one time or like left a YouTube comment that like, or no, 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 maybe, maybe I heard it from a coworker. Like somebody got a notification on Ring and they check the footage and their house was being robbed. Like they watched it happen this, this was and me called the cops. To you before a surveillance. You, so okay, you I, told me about it. <laughs> I, I sold I sold a PS4 to someone on Craigslist and because their home just got broken into. And they said, this is so this is local near me. Um, they literally were watching the people in their home on their security cameras and they went to the police. Like they called the police right there and then. They're like, there's people literally in my house and they didn't respond to it. <laughs> it's crazy. Checks out. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So security can, and I mean, that'll be, that'll be great evidence later if assuming they ever catch the guys and they can be like, well, you know, we have this footage, we can place you at the scene of the crime. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can do in my opinion. Like I said, I'll leave this blog post. It's not comprehensive obviously, but, um, also I'm an apartment dweller. So a lot of this home security advice I read is for like houses, you know, like, oh, plant hedges and a fence. And it's like, I can't do that. I, I tried to keep apartment dwellers in mind also when I, I wrote this blog post. Little little things like using a better lock, if you're capable of doing that um, as an apartment dweller, like make sure they change the lock in between you and the other person moving out. I'm sure the other person moved out. Like, I'm sure they don't want to be there anymore, but you never know. People are weird. Be mindful of windows that are close to walkways. You know, people can snatch and grab. Put up like beware of dog signs or like this home protected by ADT. Even if you're not paying for ADT, it may make people reconsider. Yeah, I'll try to leave that in the the show notes, but um, it is a good subject. I, I definitely encourage everybody to kind of look into it a little bit and just think about, you know, parking under street lights, stuff like that. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is I just wanted to kind of outline here. You say you have a normal threat model in a relatively low crime area, so you're not really like at any immediate risk to anything so in my eyes we know what because i'm always trying to balance convenience with this stuff so your, your whole life doesn't revolve around your home security um, i'd say as long as you're doing better than the people around you you're already in a good place because people are looking for easy targets and if you're not an, a targeted individual um, they're just going to be skimming for easy easy stuff and i would I, I would assume if you're doing some basic stuff you're already going to be ahead of everyone else and then just to just to outline here, Edhead asked, do you guys run VPNs on all of your devices 24 seven? And then Patreon asked, I have started running my own website and posting there instead of social media. How would I get it out there? How did both of you let the world know that tech lore and the new oil existed? Um, so these are two questions we're going to answer in shorts later this week. So stay subscribed and we will publish those um, to the world then. And that was everything for this week. So we have the Restrict Act, which I'm optimistic won't pass, but still call your Congress people, tell them it's BS, tell them you want actual data privacy laws, and we will keep you updated as that one develops. We have uh, an update to that story in Florida about the um, 
the water uh, water poisoning, attempted water poisoning. And, uh, you know, this is, again, like Henry said multiple times, this is why you stay updated because we're always learning new things. We're correcting the record. Um, you know, we all kind of got hoodwinked by that one, unfortunately. We have Wi-Fi protocol flaws, lots of political news, all kinds of stuff happening this week. It was a pretty busy week. So stay subscribed and we will definitely have more updates next next week. Thank you guys again for supporting us, helping us stay sponsor free. If you want to help support us, $5 a month on Patreon, you can ask a question. $10 a month, you don't have to listen to the spiel and you got some of our longer rants this week. I definitely got in a couple soapboxes. If you don't care about the rewards, but you just want to support us in a recurring way, we have Libra Pay and that is very helpful. And then if you don't care about any of that, but you do care about your privacy and you just don't want to mess with Fiat at all, we have Monero, which is totally anonymous. We don't see anything about you. And uh, thank you, no matter which way you choose to support us, thank you so much for keeping us going. Thank you for listening to Surveillance Report. The final thing we want to ask of you, share the podcast around. Make sure you are subscribed. Give us a rating if you're on a platform where that's an option. We're trying to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy, and you can help us do that. So thank you again for listening, and we will be back next week.